Good evening. Thank you very much, Lori, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you all for joining us. Uh, the poll keeps coming in and we've got people from uh, all over the country and uh, I think uh, increasingly from all over the world. Um, so I'm Josh Ginsberg. I'm the president of the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies. Uh, we're based in the Hudson Valley of New York. Our headquarters is in Millbrook, New York. And our work addresses urgent environmental challenges. Uh, I have a staff of 110 and I work with 25 of the smartest PhD scientists in the world. We have five areas of focus, freshwater ecology, urban ecology, disease ecology, forest ecology, and climate change, which of course is a driver of almost every ecological process these days, uh, mostly directly and even indirectly. Interestingly, uh, tonight's topic, forest health, intersects with all these directly and indirectly. Uh, and I look forward to um, Gary explaining how urban ecology and uh, disease ecology, of course, uh, and forest ecology uh, intersect so directly. Um, now, uh, the results of the poll jumped up on my screen and then disappeared, uh, but let me see if I can uh, get them back. Um, here we go. Um, so more than half of you are first timers, so thank you. One of the great things about the uh, science conversations, the carry conversations, is that we are bringing people in from all over the country and people who didn't know us before. And then the rest of you have either been to one or two or, or frequent flyers. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, emerald ash borer, borer and gypsy moths uh, are at the top of the list. Uh, hemlock woolly adelgid very close uh, there as well. Uh, you clearly seem to be a group of people who are observant. Uh, and although I must admit, uh, emerald ash borer and gypsy moths uh, are hard to miss these days. Um, so uh, without further ado, um, I'm going to uh, introduce our, our guest tonight. Um, I will interview Gary, but he's really the speaker. Gary Lovett is a senior scientist at the Cary Institute. He's been at the Institute for several decades. Uh, he came and uh, like many Cary staff, has stayed for almost his entire career. Uh, Gary's areas of expertise are broad, but uh, focus uh, pretty much on the general realm of forest ecology. And uh, I'm really glad to have him here. Um, he's been working on this area for, for several decades, uh, but I'm really interested in you know, trying to figure out uh, and having Gary explain to us you know, how, as a forest ecologist, uh, he uh, came into this area. So Gary, welcome to the Cary Science Conversation. Uh, Thanks, Josh. It's our third conversation, uh, our second one focused on forests. Um, you know, you didn't start out studying forest pests and pathogens uh, for your PhD or even as your postdoc. So how did you land on the issue of imported, imported forest pests as an area of research and, and action? Yeah, before I answer that question, Josh, first of all, thanks for the, for the introduction. And, and, uh, but I was just looking at the chat and it's really, really amazing to see people uh, uh, tuning in from, from all over the place with, with pest problems of all different sorts. But I, I thought based on that, I, I would draw a distinction um, so people understand what we're doing here. We really have two different kinds of invasive forest pest problems in the country. One is native forest pests that are expanding their range because of climate change. You know, and a good example is the mountain pine beetle in the west and the southern pine beetle here on the east coast. Uh, so those are invasive because they're moving to new areas, but they're native, they're native pests. And the other kind of invasive forest pests are the kind that we bring in through international trade from other continents and countries. And those are the, mainly the type we're going to be talking about tonight. So they, they, they hitchhike basically on international trade. When they get here, they don't have the, uh, the predators that they had in their native land and trees aren't evolved to have defenses against them so the populations can explode. So I saw both kinds of pests coming up in the, in the scrolling and I just want to draw that distinction for people. But anyway, back to your question, how did I get into this? It's a kind of an interesting story. I was doing work on, uh, well, I'm a forest ecologist, a field ecologist, and I was doing work on, on effects of uh, air pollution and climate change on, on trees. We had, I was working a lot out in the Catskill Mountains, which are in southeastern New York, and uh, we had uh, forest plots that we had put in that we had been monitoring for 10, 15 years. So mainly we were looking at the effects of air pollution, nitrogen pollution on these, on these forests. And I had a problem, and the problem was these forests were dying. And they weren't dying of climate change and they weren't dying of air pollution, they were dying of forest pests. You know, our, our hemlocks had the hemlock woolly adelgid, our beach stands had, had beach bark disease, and the oak stands had 
had were attacked by gypsy moths. So this this image that's up there now is a is an oak stand in the Catskills in the middle of the summer uh, during a gypsy moth attack. So you can say, see it's nearly completely defoliated by the gypsy moth. And so when I saw this happening, I realized that you know this was the most severe and urgent threat to these forests. It wasn't the longer term threats of air pollution and climate change. And I sort of reoriented my research program to work on them. Um, and, and I started talking to colleagues around the country uh, and realizing they had similar problems. And then I started working with a group called the Science Policy Exchange. They are an organization that tries to take scientific information and put it into the policy sphere. Uh, and uh, with the Science Policy Exchange, we organized a, uh, a group of experts. They were, um, uh, so there were economists, there were ecologists, there were entomologists, there were policy experts, and we got together and we reviewed the scientific le literature on the economic and ecological effects of forest pests, but we also listed a number of policy options that the federal government could take to try to reduce the, uh, the presence of these pests in the country. So we wanted this work to be policy relevant. So that's how I sort of got started on the policy end of this. Yeah, and, and I think it's important, I want to emphasize Number one, it's not common for a carry scientist to issue a, a major synthetic ecological review, which is normal, and a policy action document on the same day, right? So the, the uh, tree smart trade document, which Gary will talk more about, came out at the same time, and um, it's really uh, been influential in moving this issue forward. Uh, but this is not a new issue. I mean, this is an issue that's been plaguing our forest for quite a while. When did this really sort of kick in? Well, as soon as we started uh, traveling to North America, we started bringing invasive species with us, but um, the forest pests uh, really started accumulating uh, in the middle 1800s. Uh, this graph that uh, was brought up here, uh, you can see in the red line, the, the y-axis is a cumulative number of forest pests, and you can see we're up to almost 450 uh, uh, external imported forest pests here. These are just the insect pests, they don't include the diseasers. And so th this is the cumulative number, and I think cumulative is the way to plot this because once these things in our country or in the country, we don't get rid of them. We're, we're still dealing with pests that were imported in the 1850s. So that's been going up steadily. Uh, and the brown line, it's been going up at a rate of about 2.6 per year or 26 per decade since the middle of the uh, 1800s. The brown line down there is the wood boring insects. Uh, and that is a subset of the, of the red line there of all insect pests. You can see that was going up pretty steadily also, but you can see around uh, the middle 80s that, started, that rate started to increase. And uh, the reason it started to increase was that was when we started really using containerized shipping. You can see that image on the right of a container ship. That's, that's the way most of our goods are transported across the ocean now is in those large container ships. And those containers, uh, very efficient for transporting goods, uh, but inside them uh, is wooden packaging material like pallets and crates. And that wooden packaging material can carry insects uh, burrowed into it. And so that's why the wood boring insects have started to increase uh, along with the, the, the use of containerized shipping. This, this graph ends around 2006 or so, but we've been steadily in, uh, importing other pests since then. I got a picture of a few uh, that we've uh, have been brought in recently. The, the picture on the upper left there is a spotted lanternfly. Uh, that's an insect that was brought into uh, eastern Pennsylvania in 2014. It's well established now in eastern Pennsylvania and starting to spread to neighboring states. Uh, its main host is Ailanthus, uh, tree of heaven, which is an invasive tree. So that's kind of a good thing. You know, we have an invasive pest attacking an invasive tree, but uh, its secondary hosts, unfortunately, are things like apples and grapes. And so the orchards and vineyards in Pennsylvania are really suffering from this thing. It also attacks a lot of hardwood trees. We don't have enough information yet to know how lethal it's going to be to those hardwood trees. The, the image on the upper right is the Asian longhorn beetle. That's an insect that keeps getting re-imported in this wooden packaging material. We keep having outbreaks around the country. There's an active outbreak now in Worcester, Massachusetts, another one in Southern Ohio. And there was just a new one reported in May from just outside of Charleston, South Carolina. And the, the USDA comes in and tries to eradicate these outbreaks, but it just keeps popping up. That's a very destructive pest whose, whose favorite host is maples. 
Um, and the image on the bottom, you can see that's those are beech leaves. You can see that sort of stripy look to them. That's, that's the uh, symptom of a new disease called beech leaf disease. This one is so new, we don't even know what the causal agent is of this disease. They're still working on that. But it seems to have spread throughout the southern end of Lake Erie in, in Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York. And it recently jumped to Long Island and Connecticut and Westchester County in New York. So it seems to be able to spread on its own. So that's a, that's a scary one that's coming along. So we're still importing lots of new pests. Well, uh, it also sounds like the geographic distribution is quite wide. Um, are, you know, are there any areas of the country that are particularly hard hit by this? Is it related to factors like you mentioned container ships, so ports, or do things come in on airplanes and therefore more diffuse? Uh, what's the geographic impact of this? Yeah, pretty much any place in the U.S. that has a tree has a forest pest problem. Uh, you can see that from the map that's up there that uh, it's the the uh, hardest hit areas are in the Northeast and the upper Midwest and on the West Coast. We here in New York State have more forest pests than any other state. Uh, that's, that's a record we're not too terribly fond of, but it's, but it's true. Uh, and you mentioned ports, and certainly the ports are the main place where these come in. But once, the, once these containers get to the ports, they get shipped all over the place. So, so uh, an insect pest can actually break out anywhere in the country. And once it breaks out, it can move anywhere in the country. Just a, a couple of examples. So uh, on the West Coast, for instance, uh, you know, in the, in the alpine zones of the Rockies and the Sierras and the Cascades, there's a disease called the white pine blister rust that affects the five needle pines, the white pine group. It's particularly hard on a species called the white bark pine, which is a foundational species for those alpine ecosystems in the, in the, in the alpine zones of the, uh, the Rockies and the Cascades. And it's, it's actually caused that species to be uh, the first widespread tree, tree species that's ever been considered for listing as an endangered species. So that, that tree is really in trouble from this white pine blister rust. And then in Northern California and Oregon, there's sudden oak death. It's been killing oaks and tan oaks throughout that region. It's causing widespread mortality in those trees. In Southern California, there's something called the polyphagous shot hole borer. That's a, that's a, that's a mouthful. Uh, polyphagous means it eats many things and this thing is really leaving up, living up to its name. It's, it attacks something like, oh, it's over a hundred different tree species that it attacks. And it includes uh, avocados. So you can imagine the growers in Southern California are pretty alarmed about that as are uh, guacamole lovers everywhere. In the East Coast, we also have a, a number of different pests, just, uh, just a couple of examples. Uh, the emerald ash borer was introduced uh, into Mi uh, Michigan, uh, probably in the 90s was first discovered in 2002. It's the most destructive pest that we've ever introduced into the country. It's spreading throughout the country. It's pretty much completely lethal to ash trees, all the, all the trees in that genus. There, are, there are, seem to be a few that survive, but not very many. Uh, and it's now spread to 33 states. It's, it's as far west as uh, Colorado and Texas. Uh, the spotted lanternfly I mentioned before, that uh, was introduced into Pennsylvania. And it, because of its ability to spread uh, by laying its eggs on things like railroad cars and Winnebago's, it can spread a long way pretty fast. So that's likely to spread further fairly quickly. In the southeastern US, there's something called a laurel wilt. That's a disease that's spread by a small beetle that attacks uh, trees uh, that are laurel and bay trees, uh, which are important trees in, in the southeast, uh, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. And they are uh, foundational trees for the forest ecosystems in Everglades and National Park. And that's what that picture is there. There's one study that shows that over 300 million trees have already been killed by the laurel wilt. So that's a very severe disease in the southeastern U.S. Those are just three examples. Unfortunately, we have a lot to pick from. With four, over 400 introduced uh, insects alone, I'm sure you do. It sounds though like, you know, when, when you're talking about it, that, that most of the impact is in the forests, uh, in the Everglades. So in addition to pythons, they've got um, uh, laurels dying, uh, but, but out in, the, in, the, in, the, in nature as it were. And I was wondering, is that, is that the case? Are the most economically damaging uh, impacts on forest products industry and forest owners? Well, you know, it was a surprise to me to read the literature on, uh, on that. I, you, you think that, you know, this is a forest pest problem. You would expect the, the problems to be mainly in the forest. But actually, if you look at the, the costs 
uh, distribution of who's paying for this. Uh, you can see in this little graph here on the left that uh, the timber owners are really, it's only a small portion of the cost of this that's being footed by the timber owners or the federal government. The main part of the cost is being footed by uh, local governments and homeowners. And that seems counterintuitive at first, but when you think about it, if a tree dies in the forest, you lose the value of the tree. If a tree dies in your yard or in a city, the tree's a danger and you have to take it down and, and that costs a lot of money. And so that's why local governments are spending a lot of money to deal with these pests that sweep through cities. Homeowners get a double whammy. Uh, they have to take down the tree and that costs a lot of money, but they also lose property value when uh, they take down a big tree like that. Their, their, their home becomes worth, le worth less as a result of the loss of the tree. So really it's local governments and homeowners that are uh, undergoing the largest burden of cost here. Of course, this is just uh, the costs that are easy to um, tally what's in this study here. We know it's an underestimate. It doesn't include the diseases, for instance, but uh, it, do it, it do also doesn't include um, sort of ecosystem services that these trees provide in cities. They clean the air, uh, they cool the streets, and they cool houses. And they um, also uh, can retain stormwater, keep stormwater from coming off the, off the streets and into the, into the sewers. So, you know, cities are investing a lot in green infrastructure and this really puts that investment at risk. And of course, there's another issue with the cities and that, that is that uh, there's, a, there's a quality of life issue. Um, and uh, you could imagine if you lived on this street here uh, and uh, they, this is a street in St. Paul, Minnesota, that they had to cut down the trees because of uh, emerald ash borer coming through. Um, and you can imagine if you lived on that street, your quality of life is going to change considerably when you all of a sudden no longer have a shaded tree lined street and you just have a row of stumps like that. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, so uh, now I've got to see because I just closed up. I went into full screen accidentally. So. It's interesting. I, mean, I, I agree. I mean, my brother and I just cut down dozens of dead ash trees that were threatening our property. And mm -hmm. uh, it, as you say, it is not cheap. And uh, we now have piles of ash to burn. And it looks like uh, a bit of a logging camp. So I can see how that affects people's uh, both the aesthetics and the, and the value. Yeah. But, but there's another piece of this. I mean, we have successively elms, chestnuts, uh, now oaks out west, uh, ash, hemlock, uh, been taking out components of the ecosystem. And I was wondering, what are the ecosystem level impacts and ecological consequences of these successive waves, waves of loss? Yeah, uh, so, I mean, this is obviously what we study at the Cary Institute is the ecosystem impacts, you know, and, 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 and first, you know, this is the only forest threat that can really practically eliminate an entire tree species or sometimes an entire tree genus in a matter of a couple of decades. You know, no other forest threat does that. And that's what happened to chestnut and elm in the last century. And that's what's happening to ash right now, the whole genus of ash and maybe hemlock as well. And, but it's not just the trees, of course, there's a cascading effect. And the, the hemlock woolly adelgid is a great example of that because there's a lot of work on it. You have this tiny little bug, the adelgid is an aphid-like insect. It, it settles at the base of a hemlock needle uh, and it starts to suck the juices out of the ray parenchyma cells. And you know, one bug that wouldn't bother the tree, but when you have millions and millions of them on the tree, it eventually kills the tree. And hemlocks are one of our main old growth species here in the east. They form these uh, dense stands uh, that are dark and cool and, and they live for a long period of time. And when those trees die, uh, that stand opens up and a lot of changes happen as a result of that. So we have this gro old growth uh, forest decline and that releases successional vegetation, but it also allows a foothold for invasive plants to get into the stand. Um, of course, it changes all the carbon and nitrogen cycling in the stand. The tree species change uh, affects the soils, it affects the sequestration of carbon in the, in the trees and you know, all sorts of uh, factors like that. That's what I study. I could talk for hours on that, but, but I won't. Uh, it, as you imagine, it also uh, uh, affects the wildlife. Uh, there was a recent study from Connecticut that showed the, which birds increase and which birds decrease as a result of hemlock decline. One of the ones that decreases the most is the black-throated green warbler. That's what I have a picture of there. There was a 93% decline in that bird uh, in the areas where the hemlock declined. And another thing about hemlock is that it, it uh, often grows along stream sides. So 
uh, when you when the trees die, it opens up the canopy and allows light into the stream and that warms up the stream and that decreases the suitability of the habitat for cold water fish like the brook trout are shown there. So this is really a cascade of effect that reverberates throughout the ecosystems. It's not just the trees. Well, and then there are secondary effects because brook trout are native and then the non-native introduced species get a, a better foothold yeah. and, right, and right. so it continues. So clearly a complicated problem, uh, which is probably why it's taken us so long to really start to figure out the economic and ecological impacts. But it's also, I think, surprisingly, a frighteningly expensive problem. And as you said, cities, and you tied this to urban ecology very nicely, cities are, are you know, on the front edge, often it's where those insects and, and rusts and other uh, invasive species arrive. Yeah. Uh, and so it's very expensive for them as they are investing in million tree movements and other such things. So you've given some prescriptions for uh, what we can do about it. So what can we, can we do about it, right? Yeah, so it is a complicated problem. Um, I, like to, I think it's worth stepping back first and, and talking about this. This is really a problem of international trade and travel. Uh, this image is a, an image I like a lot. The, in in the, uh, the blue lines in this image are international air routes. The green lines are international shipping routes. And so you can see the level of interconnectedness there is uh, among the, the continents here. So these, these lines then connect our countries and they connect our cities and our businesses, but they also connect our ecosystems in ways that they haven't been connected for, I don't know, probably a hundred million years since all the continents were last together in the supercontinent of Pangaea. So we are, we are highly connected and, and, and all this trade and travel is what's moving these organisms around. So uh, it, you can't really focus on individual organisms. You have to fo focus on the pathways uh, by which these, these organisms get here. So when we decided to think about what policy options, we, we had to make a couple of priorities. And we, the first thing we said was it really makes a lot more sense to try to keep these pests out of the country in the first place rather than trying to deal with them after they're here. In a lot of cases, you can't deal with them after they're here. There's no way to eradicate them. Uh, biological control is, is promising, but it's not always effective and has its own risks. So the best thing is to just keep them out of the country. And so we know how these pests get here. There's been quite a bit of good science on this. There's a lot of, lot of different pathways, you know, and of course the internet sales is increasing as a pathway, but the main pathways uh, are wood, wooden pallets and wood packaging material that's inside those shipping containers. That's number one, that brings in the wood boring insects. And the other is nursery plants that are brought in for landscaping. So uh, we bring in uh, a lot of plants that are either uh, plants that are uh, native to other countries or they're even our own plants that were propagated overseas and brought back here just because it's cheaper to do it. So those are the main pathways by which things are, bro are brought in. And we have, um, you know, regulations that are supposed to keep the pests out of both of those pathways, but the regulations are only partially effective, usually less than 50% effective at keeping them out. So they're just not good enough yet. And we just have to strengthen those regulations, strengthen the measures that we have to keep them out of those pathways. So we, uh, when we, uh, we we tried to make some recommendations for for how to do this, and we have a we have a brochure that it goes into some detail on what those recommendations are. But in general, this is what they are. And we call this package of recommendations tree smart trade, and they're really based on the science that we did and what we looked at for you know what what are, what are the ways this is getting in and how could you keep them out. The first thing is we need to restrict the importation of live plants. Uh, we certainly shouldn't bring in any plants that are in the same genus as our native plants here in the U.S. We should switch to pest-free packaging material for international shipments. So, so we need to keep the, the wood boring insects out of that, those pallets and crates and things. We have to expand our early detection and rapid response program. So we have better, so we have better surveillance for new pest outbreaks and we can eradicate them before they get big. We need to tighten enforcement of the penalties that we already have. They were pretty much uh, unenforced. I'll you know, talk a little bit later about how that's changed a little bit. And we need to expand our international pest prevention programs with key trading partners so that we can be sure that these shipments are clean before they leave the exporting port. If we do those five things, we can really, we can really make a difference in this, in this problem. 
Yeah, and, and you know, I uh, being an ecologist and, and having uh, friends and family always say, when we tell them the results of our work, they say, oh, but that's so logical, right? Um, and I think this is a great example of where it's logical, but it's still really difficult. Um, you know, there, there's some economic values. IKEA switched to uh, plastic pallets, and, and they did it not for ecological reasons, although they're green, uh, but because it was cheaper and they could pack more into the to the uh, containers and, and therefore cut their shipping costs. So I, I think getting these out there is really important. Now, most people don't know that scientists, um, particularly scientists who are serious scientists, and, and let's just say some of the, all of the Cary staff are some of the most serious scientists I know. They publish a lot. They have multiple research projects. They don't have to teach, so they spend all of their time thinking science. And it's not common for someone to take a lot of time off and go you know, to Washington and work with various agencies, uh, uh, talk to the Congress, educate the Congress. And so, Gary, it was really unusual. I remember my second or third board meeting, I put up a slide that said, you know, Mr. Lovett goes to Washington to uh, joke on the Mr. Smith goes to Washington uh, meme. But as a scientist, how did you end up carrying the water on advocacy and education of Congress? I mean, as it were, what's a nice scientist like you doing on Capitol Hill? <laughs> Yeah, uh, that wasn't what I intended uh, at the start, to tell you the truth. When we put together that synthesis project and published that paper with the policy options on it, the plan was to do the science, to uh, summarize the data in a policy relevant way, to make a translation document that policymakers could understand, to do a, you know, a briefing on Washington to let people know that we've done this and you know, visit Capitol offices, but then hand this off to an environmental organization, hopefully a large national environmental organization to do the advocacy work uh, to, to, you know, to really make sure this, this, uh, the laws were changed so that we could protect our forests from, from these pests. Unfortunately, we didn't find uh, national organizations that um, had this on their priority list. Uh, they said, yeah, you're right, that's, that's good stuff, uh, but we have you know, 10 things on our priority list and that's not one of them. So I realized that um, if there was gonna be any progress made on this, uh, we're gonna to have to do it ourselves. Uh, and so that's what we've been doing. We've been trying to form a coalition. You know, we've been sort of leading the charge on this and trying to form a coalition of groups that uh, support us. And that includes environmental organization, but it also includes like the National League of Cities and, and other groups that are concerned about, about uh, uh, tree, tree death. So we're trying to build up that, um, that groups, those, those groups, so we have a coalition. We've been doing a lot of communication work. We've been doing a lot of visits to Washington, congressional briefings and things like that. Um, but it's not easy. We do have opposition. There are groups that uh, want to sell more pallets, for instance, and they don't like to hear what we have to say about pallets. Uh, so, uh, and the, of course, there are a lot of groups that don't want any further restrictions on international trade. So that, that, there is a lot of opposition here. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I joked uh, with, with friends that, that we knew we were making progress when the, uh, the Pallet Manufacturers Association uh, called you a radical environmentalist. <laughs> um, and while Gary is an environmentalist um, and he can be radical in his scientific approach, um, I don't think the two words as radical environmentalist have the meaning they intended. Um, but, you know, I understand why they felt this way because there's been some real progress. So uh, can you talk about some of the progress on tree smart trade getting down to a little bit of the, the sort of details of how the sausage is made in Washington. Yeah, so yeah, we have been doing a lot of uh, congressional briefings and visits to congressional offices. We've been doing a lot of um, uh, talking to agency staff, particularly the, the agency that really uh, controls this, and that's the uh, a branch of the USDA called APHIS, the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service. But we have had some recent successes, so we're, we're making some progress. The first and probably the most important one is that uh, Customs and Border Protection, so Customs actually does the inspections at the ports, uh, and they have started uh, increasing the stringency of their enforcement of the wood packaging regulations. Prior to this, they really didn't enforce them much at all. Uh, and you know, so we called for specifically for strength, more stringent enforcement of those. And I have to credit a, a colleague of mine, Faith Campbell, who's also been calling for this for a, for a long time. But anyway, customs got the message. They now are penalizing um, 
um, importers more frequently when their shipments come in and they have pests in them. And those penalties can be pretty severe. There can be a large fine. And sometimes they just turn the ship around and say, you have to take this somewhere else. Uh, and it has to go back to the, basically back to the port where it came from uh, to be treated. And this is costing uh, shipping industry uh, quite a bit of money and they're upset about it. And they're now actively looking for solutions to this, which is a good thing, right? That's what, that's what we want. Another thing we did was we got some language in the farm bill in 2018 uh, that um, required that the USDA do a comprehensive report on this issue and what the possible solutions are. So this, is a, this was an opportunity. We hoped for them to step back and take a look at the whole problem and saying, what are the policies we have? What's working? What's not working? How can we tighten this up? Uh, and that report is due next March. And we are looking forward to the release of that report. We've been talking to the people at USDA who are, who are uh, putting it together. And we hope that that will come up with some good recommendations and be a springboard for future action. And lastly, we have a new project that the USDA APHIS has, has funded us to do. And it involves working with importers and shippers uh, to develop guidelines and procedures that they can use to minimize the, the, wood, the pests in their wood packaging material. As I told you, the shippers are very motivated to do this now because they're, uh, it's costing them a lot of money when they get caught at the border with, uh, or at the port with, with pests in the wood packaging material. So uh, we're seeing some progress in that also. We're right in the middle of that. We've been having you know, weekly or biweekly meetings with this group of shippers to, to talk about what, what measures can be taken. So those are all positive things. We're, I think we're moving in the right direction. Well, and it's, it's interesting, by increasing the costs for the shippers uh, and the importers, you all of a sudden change the dynamic. So uh, moving to alternative pallets, moving to different packing materials, uh, all of a sudden becomes an economically viable strategy because it's, you know, it's just shifting the balance of doing business. Um, and you know, what's I think interesting, you didn't mention this, but I think it's really important. Um, this has been really bipartisan and I've That's been true. really mm -hmm. impressed uh, both sides of the aisle gone behind this are our own congressman. You started talking to Chris Gibson, John Faso then was the one who helped get the language in the farm bill and Antonio Delgado's staff and, 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 and Congressman Delgado have been phenomenally helpful. And so those are, for those of you who are further afield than Millbrook, those are the last three congressmen from our district. The first two are Republican and the most recent one is Democrat. And they see this as a problem that is severe and influencing their district and influencing New York State and influencing the country. And so it seems to be one of those areas where we've been able to get bipartisan support. And that is these days quite remarkable. And I, I think, again, one of those really interesting places where we are able to say science matters, understanding the problem matters, and yeah. getting solutions that are science-based matters. And mm -hmm. so I'm really proud as president of the institution to continue to talk about science in a time when science is not always as well respected. Of course, the other thing is we can take action as individuals. So I know that, you know, we've got, I just asked Lori and she told me, we've got 432 people uh, listening to us, which is a new record for us. Uh, we had 975 sign up, it's about right. We get about 50% of the people who sign up arriving. So for those of you who arrived, thank you. Uh, but people from all over the country are listening. So what can people do to make this better? What, what individual actions can they take that will help start to reduce this problem? Yeah, um, so uh, we really need to raise the profile of this issue if we're gonna get some political traction in, in, in Washington. We visit a lot of um, Congress, congressional offices where they, you know, they haven't really heard of the problem or they don't understand that you know, the bug that's affecting their district is, and the bug that's affecting somebody else's district are all both, all, they're all symptoms of the same problem. So you, you kind of have to back up and, and explain it to them. And, and, and they and they need to hear from their constituents about that. But for 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 people everywhere, there's a couple of things that that you can do to help the problem. One, one is buy native plants. Uh, don't buy exotic plants. So, you know, we're, I said that one of the main pathways by which these things get into the country is, is uh, woody plants that are brought in for, for landscaping. We ought to use our native plants for that and, and, you know, basically cut off the demand for importing those plants. So that would help a lot. You cannot move firewood around. That, that doesn't keep these uh, pests from getting into the country, but it does keep them from spreading so fast. Some of them, uh, once they're already in the country. Emerald ash borer, for instance, spreads a lot by people carrying firewood firewood from one place to another. Asian longhorn beetle can, can uh, spread the same way. So, you know, if you, if you have firewood, burn it locally. If you're going somewhere to go camping, 
take, buy the firewood there. Don't, don't, don't move it around. But I think the most important thing you can do is to use your own voice and speak up about it. Because as I said, we need to raise the profile of the issue. And you can contact your congressmen, your senators. You can contact national environmental organizations if you belong to a national environmental organization. So, you know, for instance, the Nature Conservancy, and they, they have a very small program in this. They, they have a, actually have a history of doing a lot of great work on this. A lot of the work that I summarized uh, earlier in, in this conversation was work that was sponsored by the Nature Conservancy. Uh, but it isn't one of their priorities for government action at this point, because I think they don't hear from their members that this is a priority for them. So they, they need to hear from you about that. So if you speak up and contact your representatives and, and national environmental organizations, we can, we can work together and try to get some traction and make some political progress on this. Right, and you can also help this uh, presentation go viral when we send you the link. Send it to everybody on your social media, get them to do so, and, and raise the profile of this. Uh, Gary, uh, thank you. That was great. We have, oh, several dozen questions, and we've got about 20 minutes for the questions, so we've Good. got time to really be considered in, in how we answer them. Um, you know, Ed Burke from Staten Island says, when a citizen sees and identifies a forest pest, to whom do they report it? And what role can citizens play as sort of the eyes and ears or the, the, the sort of uh, frontline observers uh, to keep these threats from getting into our forests and possibly identifying them early in the process when they first arrived and they're very localized? Yeah, that is, that is a good question. And you know, for our major pest outbreaks, it has been citizens that have identified these pests. Uh, we have a national surveillance program, but it rarely actually catches these, these um, uh, out these new outbreaks because uh, you know it just can't be everywhere all the time. So if you do see a pest um, that you think is unusual, you haven't seen it before, it's really worth you know first you might do some searching on the internet to see if you, it it seems like something that's coming up as a as a possible invasive pest. Um, if you're near a, a cooperative extension unit uh, for you know the university in your state, uh, you can contact them and they have a um, an entomological unit that can uh, identify these pests. Uh, maybe there's a, a you know extension unit in your county. Uh, those those people are also trained to be able to identify these pests. So that's the best place to go to to report it. Um, unfortunately, citizens do find it difficult to get through sometimes, um, and there are some efforts afoot to try to make a national cell phone based reporting system. It really hasn't gotten off the ground yet, but you can check it out. There's something called EDMAPS, E-D-D-M-A-P-S. Uh, and uh, you can try using that cell phone app to report things. I think that it isn't always clear that it gets to the people it needs to get to, but, um, but it certainly allows you to record that and yeah, take a picture great. of it. And I know U.S. Forest Service has urban field stations in Baltimore, in New York, in Boston, and other cities. True. And it, it'd be worth, you know, the Forest Service staff, we work with them all over the country, and they tend to be pretty responsive. Yeah, that's um, yeah, true. Uh, they're the frontline warriors on this mm -hmm. issue, so it's in their best interest. Um, and, 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 you're, and you were right about the urban forests. I mean, these things, because they come into ports, they're often it's the urban forests that are hit first. Right. And so people keeping their eyes out on the city trees, um, can help us a lot, can save yeah. the rest of the forest. Yeah, and, and as you said, um, you know, there, there are outbreaks of, of longhorn beetle and trying to get there and, and, and get there before they spread is really important. So again, early identification is critical and citizen science, I mean, as you noted, cell phones have changed that world, right? And uh, if we can uh, find a, a really eager beaver, you know, young undergraduate who wants to set it up and, and write the code, that would probably help. Um, so someone, there are a number of questions like this, and I'm sorry if, if, if we, I'm, John, I'm using John Glade's question, but uh, many of you asked the question, are there instances of forest pests moving from the US to other countries? Do we export pests uh, to Europe or to Asia? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that. I probably should have mentioned that as I, as I was going along. Obviously trade is a two way street. And uh, so things are moving in both directions. I, I think in general with the wood packaging material, we are a little better at treating our wood, wood packaging material than some of our exporting partners are. And so I, I think the US has gotten the worst of that. I mean, there's, there's two 
there's two issues really. I think probably the balance of pests is like the balance of trade for the US. There's a lot more stuff coming in than there is going out. So there's that, but also I think that we, the wood that we send out in pallets is, is cleaner than the wood coming in. And so we don't get as many pests that way. But so, so there are some, some good examples. There's, there's a, a pest or a, a caterpillar that we call the, uh, uh, the fall webworm. It's a, it's a minor pest here. We see it nearly every fall. Um, it was exported to China and they have a real problem with it in China. They call it American white moth. And um, so there's, there's things like that, that that we are exporting around. Yeah, and, and I think that's good to know. Um, you know, one of the questions, this is sort of a two-part question. John Duck said, you know, aren't the pallets made of kiln-dried wood? And so first, you know, the first part of the question is, why doesn't that kill them? And the second one was from Catherine Hines, you know, is there a movement to explore or promote building pallets out of things like recycled plastic or compressed paper or other things? Yeah, we can get into, you know, I, I, as a biologist, I never thought I would spend so much time studying pallets, but I've, but I've learned a lot about pallets in the last year or so. Uh, so um, pallets need to be, in order to be, um, I just lost my video. Nope. There you go. <laughs> um, uh, pallets need to be treated. Uh, there's an international regulation that the pallets need to be treated. They either need to be heat treated or fumigated with methyl bromide. Uh, and heat treating does not mean kiln drying. They just have to be raised to a certain temperature for a certain period of time. And that's been shown or supposedly shown to kill the pests inside it. Uh, we find pallet, and then they have to be stamped with a, an official stamp that says it was treated. Uh, and we find pallets coming into the country that are stamped, but still have bugs in them. And that either means the treatment was not sufficient, could be the case in some cases, but most people think it's at least, you know, 95% efficient. Uh, or it means that, uh, and most people think this is what's happening, that the pallet was fraudulently stamped. Uh, so, you know, you can, one, one of my contacts at USDA said they found one of these stamps for sale on eBay. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you, you kind of wonder to what extent this international regulation with the stamping is actually uh, effective. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So the, so the long term answer is substituting plastic or compressed paper or things that don't have beetles in them and don't have insects in them. Well, uh, here's, a, here, here's an interesting point I want to bring up. Yeah. Uh, and this is one of the reasons we're getting a lot of pushback on this. Pallets are an important market for low-grade wood in the U.S. Uh, I was stunned when I heard that 40 percent, 40 percent of our hardwood production goes to pallets. Wow. And it's, uh, it's uh, low-grade wood and forced uh, products companies will tell you they need a market for that low-grade wood in order to keep profitable. So that's, you know, that's a big issue. Now, we're not talking, it's only you know, most of the products we make are circulated internally, domestically, only 10 to 20% go internationally. So, um, you know, you could, so we're suggesting that, yeah, we could alter, use alternative med, uh, uh, materials for these pallets, but they could be wood-based materials. So things like plywood and, and OSB or in strand bore, those things can make a perfectly good pallet. They'll be a little bit more expensive, uh, but uh, they will still use, use wood products. Um, uh, Right now, solid wood is about 95% of the pallet market. 90, 95% of the, of the pallets that are moving around are made of solid wood. There are, there are recycled plastic pallets out there and they're used primarily by the uh, food industry and the pharmaceutical industry because they're easier to clean. Right. So, you know, we've got, um, just so people know, there are a lot of specific questions about specific pathogens and their trees on their property. And uh, we would love to have the time to do it. As Gary said, if you're in the New York State the Cornell Cooperative Extension is a great place to go for information and other cooperative extensions across the nation. Those are, uh, there's a national network of those and that's a good place to get individual information. But there's a general question, I think, Gary, and you know, property owners need a resource other than paying an arborist uh, for information and advice about systemic insecticides and pesticides that can be used to save select you know, trees on your property. Is there such a resource out there? Is there a website that you can recommend or is it so specific that, that you really have to go to one of these cooperative extensions? Yeah, I, th I think it's so specific that you do have to go to the cooperative extension. You know, you talk to arborists and some of them are very um, uh, 
reticent to use chemicals, others are not, they'll spray them around. And you know, the, the, the primary chemical that's used against say emerald ash borer is one of the neonics. So that's got, um, you know, other environmental effects. Right. Uh, so it's a complicated situation and I can't say that I'm really uh, an expert on it. So I guess I don't want to get into it too yeah, deeply. Yeah, and that's, you know, we, we as scientists, we tend not to pontificate on things that, that we are only peripherally knowledgeable about. Yeah. Um, so I think that's great. One of the questions I think actually Philip Oppenheimer asked a really interesting question and in saying, look, in the history of the natural world, extinction is not, you know, unusual. Uh, things come and go. There are dominant species in one age and not another. Um, what's the um, what's the difference, as it were? Uh, Phil didn't say it this way, but what's the difference uh, between the natural succession of of things through ecological and evolutionary time and what's happening now? Well, we're getting a you know it's a it's it's a good point. Uh, species do come and go. Um, we have you know sometimes evolution of pests that can you know cause damage to to species um, naturally. Uh, what we're getting now is just because of the volume of trade, uh, we're getting a lot of new species and they're coming at us really fast. And so we have multiple uh, trees being decimated by these pests all within a short period of time. So, you know, for instance, at the Cary Institute in Millbrook, we lost our dogwoods, uh, we're losing our hemlocks, the beach has beech bark disease, we have gypsy moth, it's just one after another, you know, and those, those stresses, the forest is still green, there are, you know, when some trees die, other trees take up that space, but we're losing diversity as we lose these tree species. And it affects all the other functions of the forest, as I talked about before when I was right. talking about hemlock woolly adelgid. Right. So we, yeah, it's just a lot coming at us really fast here. Yeah, and, and uh, oddly, we've tended to lose some of the masting species as well. And, you know, if we were to get oak, sudden oak death in the Northeast, that would be really hard on squirrels. It would probably do good things for Lyme disease, uh, but it would be really hard on squirrels and, and, and mice and other small rodents. Um, there, is a, there is a disease that's even closer than sudden oak death. There's one called oak wilt uh, right. that's showed up in uh, Albany area and down in Long Island, I believe, and that's pretty lethal to oak. So that's, a, that's one we're really watching. Oaks are having a hard enough time rec recovering from uh, overabundance of deer. So yeah, uh, yeah. it would be a one-two punch. Um, Somebody asked, and it's an interesting question I'd never really thought about, um, can we use eDNA to identify things? Uh, if we had a rapid assessment tool for eDNA for some of the major uh, pests that we're looking for, could you screen um, uh, uh, pallets and, and incoming shipments that way? Or is it just uh, unlike rivers, which constantly, you know, collect DNA and therefore in the water column you can get it, is there no real air transport of DNA that way? Well. Yeah, there, there, people are working on, on technology to try to better uh, detect these pests. Um, they're using not eDNA so much. Um, you, you could, well, actually, like sudden oak death in California has been uh, found in watersheds because they looked at the eDNA in the stream draining the watershed. So yeah, it is, it is used to detect uh, outbreaks in the field. So that, that is true. But in terms of trying to detect um, you know, pests in, in shipping containers. They're, they're using dogs, for instance. Dogs can both dogs. Hear, and, hear and smell these pests in wood. Uh, they're, they're using air sampling uh, equipment and they're trying to get all these, these, these uh, newer techniques to work. But mostly it really comes down to customs agent going through the pallet or uh, going through the ship, shipping container pallet by pallet and looking for signs of, of insects. So, yeah. you know, it's still yeah, pretty, and, and pretty for people hard know, eDNA stands for environmental DNA. And it's a very, very new process by which it was first done for say, looking for carp in the Great Lakes. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, uh, you know, there's a, a barrier to keep them out of the Great Lakes, but um, you can detect a single individual in a, in a long run of a stream because it, you know, the individual releases DNA. There are microscopic tiny bits of it and they get, then, then the scientist samples it and amplifies it. And so it's a very effective way of doing it. But I'm interested, oh, so often dogs are better than anything else at, at picking up things through scent. Um, it is frightening um, to be a dog and to live in this world. Um, somebody asked a specific question, a uh, gal Rothschild said, what about Southern pine beetle? I'm seeing some white pines up here uh, in Litchfield County look like they're affected and, and more broadly, are we seeing, do we always see the, is there a, a, a transfer of these things as the climate warms from south to north? 
Yeah, that's what's happening with southern pine beetle. I mean, that, that's for a long time been a pest of the southeast. The loblolly pine plantations in the southeast have always uh, had a problem with southern, southern pine beetle. And the foresters down there have learned, you know, you have to keep the stands thinned, you have to keep the plants healthy, the trees healthy, and they can resist the outbreaks of southern pine beetle. But as the climate started to warm, it started to move up the coast. It was in Virginia, then it was in uh, New Jersey and the Pine Barrens of New Jersey, then it was in Long Island, now it's in Massachusetts and Connecticut, so it is it is shifting northward and, and, and the, the warming climate just allows it to overwinter in places that it, it never wintered before. Um, I don't think it's in Litchfield County, so I'm not sure that's what you're seeing. There is another problem with white pine, there's a couple of problems with white pine, but they call it the, it's sort of a white pine disease complex or something that uh, people are still investigating. Uh, but it is in coastal Massachusetts and it's, I think it's moved up to coastal New Hampshire at this point. Um, so somebody asked a good question, what can we do to communicate the gravity of these invasive issues and their causes uh, into say social studies classes, science classes? Is there a curriculum uh, you know, do we need to get Alan Berkowitz, our director of education, to start working on a curriculum model uh, and try and, you know, use what is commonly called in marketing the nag factor, get kids <laughs> to be aware of this and to tell their parents yeah. and then their parents to tell their Congress people? Yeah. Well, you know, the, our educators that have been working in the Cary camp have been, have, have been using this. They've had kids out looking for pests and, you know, sampling hemlocks for hemlock woolly adelgid and, and and that sort of thing. So you, so you can get kids interested in this and, you know, turn it into a field exercise. It can be kind of fun. And they, and they understand that the, the bug is not supposed to be here and it's killing the trees and, that, and that's not a great thing. So, uh, yeah, I think, I think you can use that. I probably easier in the field than it is in the classroom. And I, you know, it would take, you probably should talk to, you know, teachers about how to make that interesting for kids in the classroom. Yeah. Um, all right, I'm just looking through some of the other questions. Uh, Gary, there are some students in the audience tonight. Any words of advice for the next generation of forest ecologists uh, related to forest pests and pathogens? Where do we need to do more research? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think that uh, the biggest um, uncertainty we have is on well, there's, there's a lot of research that needs to be done on individual pests and how the, their life cycles and, and uh, uh, you know, what are their, what host, do they, what host trees do they attack and things like that. So there's, if you're into the entomology or the phytopathology piece of that, there's a never ending uh, supply of new work for you. Uh, from the forest ecology point of view, I think the most um, daunting questions are about long-term impacts because these impacts do play out over centuries because they change tree species composition, that, ch that changes the soils. So um, we, ha we need ways to look at what's going to happen over, over centuries uh, to understand the impacts of these. And so that involves uh, uh, long-term studies, it involves comparative studies, it involves modeling. And so uh, those are all, you should have all those tools in your arsenal to look at this, path, this problem. Yeah. Um and I'm just looking other questions. Um, so there was a question, uh, I'm trying to find it, uh, about what you could use to treat um, hemlocks for hemlock woolly adelgid. And I know some of the, um, uh, you know, methylbromide or other things are incredibly toxic. Uh, and so uh, are there other approaches? I, I remember seeing some bags hanging on trees outside my office. And maybe you could talk about, you know, approaches people are taking uh, as an example of, of the uh, biocontrol. Yeah, so there are several efforts to, tr to try to get a biocontrol agent uh, for hemlock woolly adelgid. So for those of you who don't know, biological control is when you bring in a uh, predator or disease of the insect you're trying to control. You bring it into the country from usually from its native range and you release it here and you hope that it will control the population of the bug you're trying to control, in this case, the hemlock woolly adelgid. And they've been doing that. Um, it's, um, it's a tricky work. First of all, you have to show that this thing that you're bringing in eats only the, the bug that you want it to eat. Uh, and then you, this thing has to be matched with climate so that it survives here. And so there, there are a couple of uh, uh, biocontrol efforts uh, for hemlock woolly adelgid. One involves a beetle called, it's like a ladybug beetle that they release uh, that eats the adelgid. 
there's another that involves a silver fly uh, that also uh, eats the the adelgid. So, you know, they're 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 trying this. Um, they haven't had a whole lot of luck uh, yet. Uh, it's you know. I have to say that uh, biocontrol efforts for forest insects are uh, only spottily successful. They're not, they're not, they don't have a huge success rate, but uh, you know, they are basically our last best hope for things like the hemlock woolly adelgid. So, yeah. so, so we have to try them. There was actually, I should mention, there's one success, success story on this just recently. There's an insect called the winter moth that's been defoliating uh, oak and other hardwood trees along the southern New England coast, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Nantucket, and so forth. And they introduced a biocontrol agent for that. It's a kind of a fly. Uh, and it seems to have the winter moth under control. So that was a success story in biological control just within the last few years. Right. Um, somebody asked, and it's, in, it's always interests me, um, the thing that seems to be coming in when everything else dies in the Northeast uh, is often maples. And is there something about maples that keeps them resistant to these things? Uh, do they not occur in the northeast, uh, sorry, the, the northeast of Russia and China and areas that are ecologically similar? And so that's why a lot of things come across. Any idea why maples seem to be not taking it on the head as badly? Uh, they're just lucky. Uh, so, <laughs> smart, right. yeah, so, I mean, there are, ma there are maples in China, there are maples in Europe. So, uh, with our, our trading partners have, I mean, that, one of the reasons that we get hit so hard in the Northeast is that, uh, we have a lot of tree species in common with our trading partners. So in China, they have oaks and they have pines and they have maples and they have all sorts of things like yeah. that. And the same as in Europe. Uh, so, you know, a pest that's a pest of, uh, pine or ash in China gets shipped over here. And it finds uh, a similar tree here that it can eat, but it doesn't have all the defenses that have evolved against that pest, and it doesn't have the predator, so it can so it can take off. But uh, the Asian longhorn beetle, this thing that keeps popping up, and they keep trying to eradicate it, that's its primary food or its its favorite food is maples. And if, so if that gets out, uh, yeah, that's bad news for maples in the Northeast. Right. That's, that's a very um, lethal pest. So uh, we're coming up on the hour. In fact, we just hit it. So I've got one more question uh, and then um, I will uh, have to say good night. Um, are there any citizen science projects for volunteers to participate in? Uh, the, the, the Nature Conservancy, one of the things that the, the Nature Conservancy is doing is they have a Healthy Trees, Healthy uh, Cities program that uh, involves a citizen science, comp citizen science component. So that's, that's the main one I can think of at the moment. Um, there isn't a lot of good organization for citizen science on this um, uh, other than that. That's one of the things we proposed actually is that there should, the federal government should be uh, organizing a sort of a hierarchy of uh, citizens, you know, tree professionals, state agencies, federal agencies to increase our surveillance capacity. So okay. using citizen science in that in that capacity. Yeah, and, and uh, I think um, that would be something if there's somebody in the audience who has a great idea for it and wants to run with it, I'm sure we'd be happy to give some advice, mm -hmm. uh, connect them up with the people we know. I mean, as you said, the Nature Conservancy spent a lot of invest, invested a lot of money. Uh, the Grantham Foundation should get a lot of credit for that. That's right. Um, and they did a lot of the research that maybe half the research that was in that synthesis paper that Gary led. And it's really important work. And, you know, I think Nature Conservancy is going through some change and be a great time to talk to your local chapter, see if they can get engaged. Um, you know, it's the national organization. We always used to, when I worked at the Wildlife Conservation Society, we called it the $800 million gorilla uh, <laughs> because they sat where they wanted to. But they also have phenomenal networks and phenomenal resources because they're in every congressional district in the country. So we really appreciate their partnership, American Forest, uh, NRDC, Forest, yeah. EDF. It's been, there are a lot of groups out there that are doing great work. So uh, yes, you can do that. Um, you know, somebody asked, and I'll, I'll just you know, repeat for you, the, the forest products uh, industry, I think, is coming along. Um, you know, everybody's first reaction when they get hit on their bottom line is to say no. Uh, but I think we're starting to see some change there. And Gary, I think you can sleep at night knowing that your actions have been a big part of that. So to the 432 of you who joined us tonight, uh, we say thank you. This talk will be uh, posted. We'll make sure that each of you gets the link. As I said, please share it with your friends and family. If you want to support this work, 
We don't usually pitch heavily on, on these uh, co science conversations, but it is surprisingly inexpensive to do remarkably important work. And so any contributions are appreciated. Uh, we never want to charge for our, our public events. Uh, we like it that people can come. I'll say that in closing, there are very few really good sides to the pandemic, but we would never have done these events. Uh, each of them has been wonderful and we're working on the next one. Uh, if you signed up for this one, you'll get a mailing for that one. And uh, we greatly appreciate everybody coming. I'd like to thank uh, Lori Quillen and uh, Leslie Stombelti, uh, who are our uh, communication staff on this project and have really made this work. And of course, I'd like to thank Gary, both for, for the work he did and for an absolutely wonderful conversation. Uh, and thank you all for coming again and uh, have a good night. Uh, if you're in the Northeast, I hope your power stays on. Uh, we had all sorts of alternative cell phone plans that fortunately we didn't have to use. So thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, Josh. And uh, good night, everyone.